I just want to say a few welcoming words about the observatory itself and how we are approaching one of the questions that was raised at the end of Jacob's fascinating talk about the meaning of these kinds of developments for society and for humanity at large and how we might think about those um, in a global context where the science and technology are moving forward in exciting directions. So the Global Observatory was created in part to compensate for what we felt were institutional deficiencies in the ways in which some of these bigger questions about what is humanity's stake in the progress of science and technology, how those were being deliberated. And explicitly, one of the things that the observatory seeks to do is to bridge a number of boundaries that uh, conventional institutional structures have proved less effective at bridging. One of those is international because, of course, Everybody will understand that to some degree, ethical deliberations have tended to cluster around novel developments in science and technology, and these are not globally distributed. Rich countries have more of these developments than poorer countries, and as a result, there has been a kind of imbalance in where the ethical debates are first taking place and who is framing the terms of those debates. So one of the things that the Global Observer Observatory tries to do is to equalize that playing field so that other national and ethnic and cultural perspectives also have a chance to be at the discussion table. A second one is interdisciplinary, because of course a huge question like the one that was raised at the end of the last session about what is the meaning of all this for humanity and human progress, or however one wants to talk about it. Science and technology are not the only institutional voices that have something to say about that, nor the, nor the only disciplines. So part of what the Global Observatory is trying to do is to increase the conversation so that anybody with a stake in answering and addressing those questions would be able to come together in a deliberative space that is not from the start carved out and dominated by science and technology and the imaginations of science and technology. And the third bridge that we would ideally like to um, cross to some extent is the sectoral one so that uh, public and private have more of a conversational space together, especially in these days. I think that the work that science and technology do is always embedded in a search for limits. And today's discussion, as it unfolds, I think will grow and evolve just as naturally as the is this a mouse embryo discussion led us to think about. And with that, let me hand over the first panel and its introduction to Ben Hurlbut of Arizona State University, together with me, one of the directors of the Global Observatory for Genome Editing. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, so as Sheila said, I am Ben Hurlbut from the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. I'm really pleased to be chairing this um, panel, this first panel. The theme of this panel is limits on research, um, and its purpose is to foster a conversation from within, from with with three distinguished figures from three exciting and provocative domains um, in the sciences, in which questions of limits. Um, are particularly live now, where our purpose is less to establish limits and more to have a conversation about how limits are approached, how they're thought about, how questions of limits arise, whether in, in terms of setting limits or in terms of pushing past those limits, and not just limits on experimentation or on technology development or whatever, um, but, but also limits on the sorts of conversations that can happen about limits, the, the expressions of ambivalence or uncertainty, the ways in which um, within scientific spaces questions and problems of limits arise or don't arise. So we have three wonderful speakers. I'm going to um, give very truncated introductions with apologies to all of them so that we have more time for a conversation. Um, our first speaker will be Alison Muotri, who is professor at, uh, at the Departments of Pediatrics and Cellular, Cellular and Molecular Medicine here at UC San Diego, also the director of a whole variety of things, um, including the stem cell program and much else. Um, his research focuses on brain evolution and modeling neurological diseases using induced pluripotent stem cells um, and, and uh, through brain organoids. 
Our second speaker will be Matthew Porteous. Matt is the Sujarta Chuck Professor of Definitive and Curative Medicine. What a, what a title. And professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Institute of Stem Cell Biology, Biology and Regenerative Medicine, and Maternal Child and Health Research, um, at, and the Maternal Child and Health Research Institute at Stanford. Um, his primary focus uh, is on developing genome editing as an approach to cure disease, particularly blood disease, um, and especially sickle cell disease, but also um, in other uh, organ systems as well. Um, I have to note that Matt also has been, heavily, been extensively involved in uh, domains outside of the laboratory and discussions of limits. For example, he was on the National Academies Committee um, that wrote an important report on uh, a sort of ethical and governance dimensions of human genome editing. He's on the NIH Next Track Advisory Committee that perhaps we'll hear more about from Kerry Woolnitz later today. Um, uh, and finally, and maybe most importantly, he's been preparing for this conference since he was an undergraduate at Harvard, a major in history and science where he wrote an honors thesis on the recombinant DNA controversy and the sort of earliest moment of setting limits in the biological sciences. Um, last but not least, um, we have Jacob Hanna, who you have all already met, um, uh, who is, uh, um, in fact, I, I didn't mark what the, your title is, but they've already heard it anyway. Um, and, and as we all heard this morning, Jacob is doing incredibly interesting and provocative work um, in developmental biology with obvious and extensive um, technological and also ethical implications. So we are going to have brief remarks from each of our panelists, followed by a cross-panel discussion and then a discussion with all of you. So with that, I'd like to invite Allison to kick us off. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. So. Um, as you heard, uh, my focus is more on, on the brain. Um, and with the idea that if we are able to study the brain uh, outside the womb, outside the uterus, so we can understand how neurological disorders are actually um, happens uh, throughout life, um, because most of the diseases that we study has like a, a strong genetic factor, in, meaning that they will actually start uh, during the embryogenesis. Um, but as you know, I mean, we cannot like really focus on the embryo um, would be an ethical, experimentally very difficult. Um, most of the images that we have from the embryo is coming from an ultrasound, uh, the live embryo, but you cannot study the molecular level, you cannot um, check the synapses. And that's the reason why we neuroscientists don't have a clear understanding of the early stages of human um, uh, organogenesis, uh, especially in the brain. When is the first neuron that fire? When is the first network that is formed? How the neurons self-organize uh, to form the cortex, for example? And because we don't know that, um, we cannot help disorders that happens because of misfunction of these stages. So the stem cells uh, came to me as a nice tool to recreate the human brain outside the embryo. Um, so, uh, long story short, I mean, when uh, we first started working with these embryonic stem cells, um, there was uh, no clear evidence that they could actually make functional tissues um, uh, uh, in a dish. And uh, one of the first experiments that I did as a postdoc here at the Salk Institute um, was, uh, to me, very simple. I mean, what if I take those neurons that I create in a dish and transplant it back into an embryonic mouse brain if the neuronal, um, human neuronal cells become part of the mouse brain, um, I can clearly show that they become functional and part of the circuitry. That was back in 2005, and as you can imagine, it created like a turmoil of ethical questions about the first human embryonic chimera. Um, I'm not even going to, uh, to a blastocyst, it's just to the brain, so there was no reason for the cells to, to navigate other parts of the body, but that was enough to raise questions, are these animals now more humanized? Um, why you are doing these experiments? Is it um, ethically sound? Should we continue on that pathway? Um, so that was uh, one of the first, perhaps, naive experiment that was done. Uh, but it proves the point that those neurons now in a live adult animal, those human neurons are part of the circuitry. They are able to differentiate. They are able to find its way in the cortex and really respond to the input and output that the brain was generated. So we answer a specific biological questions that give us the confidence that, yes, those cells do have the capability to become functionally formed adult neurons. 
Um, so the field has evolved a lot. Um, we, we try to stay away from, from the chimeras because we want to do that with a, a full uh, human brain. That brings us um, a new tool uh, that was developed by uh, a Japanese research researcher called Yoshiki Sasai in 2008, which is a brain organoid. So you just created the cells in three dimension and let them self-aggregate forming um, what we call a brain organoid. So that increases the complexity of the model. We are no longer thinking about um, individual neurons here and there, but we are thinking about um, a, a piece of uh, brain tissue uh, that it's alive and function outside um, uh, uh, in a Petri dish. So the questions, um, in the beginning, uh, I think most of neuroscientists, including myself, were very skeptical that this technology could drive us towards the understanding of more complex diseases such as autism or schizophrenia, because that requires a circuitry network formation that we, as a neuroscientist, have the preconception that those brain organoids will never happen because they're outside of the body, they're not interacting with any other of the tissues. So that was a, a big surprise when we actually showed that um, they can create these uh, very sophisticated neural oscillations that are actually similar to the oscillations that you can get by placing electrodes in an encephalogram um, into your head. So they actually mimic the preterm postnatal uh, development of uh, the human brain. So that to me was shock. I have to revisit my beliefs of what this technology can do. And at the same time, it raises off uh, uh, ethical concerns about consciousness or self-aware. Can this structure reach um, any level of uh, uh, consciousness or self-aware that we should be worried about? And if so, what would be the moral status of those identities? Should we treat them as an animal model or should we treat them as a person? So it opens this... Um, uh, ethical question. So as this field is advancing, um, we are um, learning more and more about uh, the human brain, but also um, uh, navigating this very gray zone about uh, the ethical limitations of the research. And um, I always like to point it out that um, at least all the researchers that I know have a specific goal in mind, which is uh, to create some good for humanity, uh, to provide better treatments for millions and millions of people suffering from neurological disorders. So there is um, uh, no reason to inhibit the research, but we do have to do that in a, in a humane way. And that's why we treat the mouse models in our lab um, with uh, compassion, with uh, empathy. Um, um, uh, I, I wish one day would be completely replace the animal models by these stem cell versions. We're not quite there yet, but I think that's where science is moving uh, towards. So I'll just end by saying that, um, as you heard from Jacob, the stem cell field is full of um, controversies and, and, and is ethically challenged because we are just navigating where we are constantly um, teaching ourselves uh, new stuff. I remember uh, Dolly, the clone, um, and I was still like a student back in Brazil uh, when we hear about uh, the cloning of an entire um, animal, a mammal, and, and people were saying, wow, I mean, if you can clone a dolly, can, can, can that be happen to a human as well? And my feeling is that the society was taken by surprise because nobody knew that there was years and years of research previous to that point to reach to clone um, uh, uh, the dolly. So I, I think right now, and that's why I like this kind of a discussion um, and, and, and open that to the society, because you can see where the research is going um, and, and predict where we are going, where we want to do with that, we scientists. Um, so having like this kind of open discussions, I think is, is really important. Um, and um, so I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. Um, thank you, Allison. Uh, I'm going to take my remarks in a slightly different uh, direction um, and, and focus them on in four categories. The first is what are the um, limits that institutions are placing on academic research or other research? And I'm going to say soft and even softer if you're in the private sector. So there is, I do not have any, anybody in my institution from a top down who tells me what I should or shouldn't do. The limits get put on my research come from my uh, biosafety board who might tell me whether my, the vectors I'm using are safe or not safe. They might come from my uh, APLAC review board who might tell me that that experiment in animal is uh, feasible or not and or not humane, um, or my, maybe my IRB. But they're, they're, they're so, I would call those very soft uh, limits on what I'm able to do. 
another limit comes from if you're seeking funding from the NIH or from CIRM, um, there is external review that may weigh in on what, what will get funded. Um, that's why I say that it's even softer if you're in a private sector setting with private money where you would not be constrained uh, by any of those. Uh, limits that are put on me because, of course, you wouldn't have to report to any IRB, APB, a APLAC, or uh, external funding agency. Um, so some of the things I'm most worried about are, are not the, um, uh, not what's going to happen in academics. I'm worried about the um, uh, very rich uh, Silicon Valley uh, tech bro who decides that they're smarter than the world and they're going to do something uh, that maybe the rest of us don't believe is, is appropriate. Um, the second uh, topic is uh, related to how do we educate scientists about the potential limits uh, to what they should do. And again, I think it's, it's there in paper. Um, every training program, every NIH-funded uh, training program, so-called T32, is required to have uh, uh, um, training the responsible conduct of research or some sort of bioethics. I participate in those. Um, I find that uh, they're, they're not very effective because they're very vague. Um, and I think if we use real life examples from research going on in my lab or Hiro Nakauchi's lab or Jakob Hanna's lab, that we could engage students in the real world nuance of making these choices rather than sort of uh, more or less uh, contrived scenarios that are, 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 are proposed that we should discuss. Um, the other uh, problem, I think, when we have the education of scientists in this arena is that if you write a T32, a training grant to the NIH, you're expected to discuss your responsible for conduct for research uh, training or bioethics training. But if you say, well, we're going to just have our trainees participate in this really well-developed uh, training course, you get dinged because you didn't develop something unique to your T32. And so if, the, if and when the Global Observatory develops a fantastic set of educational materials, it actually would be frowned upon if my T32 tapped into that uh, rather than taking advantage of it. The third thing is I want to re uh, uh, highlight what um, Sheila and Dr. Jasanoff pointed out, Professor Jasanoff, if you're in Europe, uh, um, is the, the need for getting perspectives. And not only the need, and I will tell you, it's uh, just an anecdote is, is when I was uh, talking to a um, philanthropic donor who had a, spe a special interest in cystic fibrosis, and I was describing to him um, our research on using gene editing in somatic cells to potentially develop a therapy or even cure for cystic fibrosis. He, he was intrigued, but at the end he said, well, in the long run, what we're gonna have to do is embryo editing. And he just left it at that. Um, and it's just assumed that um, here's a guy worth billions of dollars, yeah, I think a billion dollars, maybe not quite that, who just assumed his worldview was the natural conclusion for where everything needed to go. Um, and so that's the flip side of what I think the Global Observatory is trying to do, is making sure it's not just Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalists who determine um, the, the, the boundaries of, of, the dis of the discussion and the debate. And then the, the final thing I want to make a point, in, and it came up in one of the questions, um, is this, and, and, uh, and I think Allison mentioned it as well, is this issue of use versus misuse. And I'm going to um, take a very specific example from my own research. So we're interested in, in using genome editing to develop specific, safe, and effective uh, gene therapies of somatic cells. But as we develop technologies to uh, engineer somatic cells to be more precise and more effective, those same technologies can repur be, be repurposed for things that we might not agree with. And I think all of us uh, have said that, well, we can't stop, I, I, I hope nobody wants to stop my research because of the potential misuse, but this long term, I mean, it goes back decades of use versus misuse is something that we always need uh, to be thinking about and how do we, uh, how do we uh, see, get transparency to it, how do we discuss it, and how would we put limits on something that was developed for a very good purpose, but somebody else may decide to use it for a purpose that we may not uh, agree with or my, uh, many of us might consider um, ethically uh, impermissible or, or ethically undesirable. So I think those are the four comments that I'll make to start this discussion. Thank you very much.
Um, that's great. I think um, as, as I've spoken and also during the questions, I've answered some of the stuff. Perhaps I would highlight three different points. Um, so one point I want to emphasize also that when we're talking about creating um, human embryo models from stem cells, it's really not an exaggeration when we say early human development is a black box. Because, you know, if you think about it, um, uh, so we're trying to understand between day and seven and 14, and then day 14 to 28, where these periods where you have gastration organogenesis, uh, it's impossible basically to get biological material. Because if you think about it, usually a woman doesn't know that she's pregnant at that stage. Let's say she somehow knows, and th again, theoretically speaking, somehow she there is approval to do a, a miscarriage, or then you, you actually do it by a pill, not by a, a, a surgical procedure. And even let's say if you theoretically somehow end up doing a, a, a surgical procedure, the the embryo material you're going to get is usually is going to be just distorted and and not normal and let's say even here and there you get a good sample for us as researchers we need the numbers you want to be able not only look at or observe at an embryo model you want to image it you want to perturb it therefore actually um, I, I think this is trying to make stem cell derived embryo models from humans is the only way to get such samples in, in a way, and uh, otherwise it's, it's just impossible really to, to do that. And it's also not only human, but if you also think uh, in primates and monkeys, also getting uh, material is, is very, very difficult. And what I emphasize that really when, and we have to understand the development from, uh, from humans and, and other primates, uh, it's really critical to our knowledge and um, uh, to complement our knowledge. Um, a second aspect um, uh, I want to emphasize um, I really welcome and enjoy, and, and I think it's our duty as scientists to engage in um, ethical discussions and difficulties, uh, but I think what I worry about sometimes if these discussions get um, a bit populist, politicized, and then that the public um, makes, or an individual makes his, his or her own decision or opinion based not on full information. And I give an example. I think back in the days when embryonic stem cell derivation and the Bush administration at the time, so if you, the way you phrase the question, if you tell a lot of people, well, if you phrase the question, well, should a blastocyst be considered a form of life or no, and are we destroying life? So that's one way of putting the question. But if you actually spell out the question and you would make sure that an individual understand well, it's not that we're asking couples to go and make blastocysts only for the purpose of research. And you highlight these are excess IVF embryos that are going to have been frozen for years and years. And then the option is, is with the consent, is this frozen embryo, are they going to be tossed into, sorry, the trash? Or can they be donated and we can we make benefit for one or two weeks? And I think when you phrase this question, it, it can give a different outcome. If, some, if an individual still does not approve, it's completely fine. But I think it's very important that, um, that the reality is conveyed very, very um, accurately on that matter. And the third and last point, uh, and we'll talk about it, I think um, we have, I think we have to also understand that different societies have um, different points of view and, li and limits on how they approach these issues. Um, I mean, I'm, uh, uh, we have, I mean, of course, US science is the leading science in the world, uh, but also sometimes some concerns is, is you know, not to have a very American centric view on the things, on, 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 on how it should be defined and what is life. And, um, and we also have, how do we deal with that? That's another point. How do we approach that? Um, and I think that is it's another point of view that uh, uh, should be taken into account uh, when, when carrying these discussions. Great. Thank you very much. So I want to I wanna, um, go back to Matt's first point about soft, soft oversight. Um, and, then in, and then ask you all a question about how questions come up in effect. I mean, one, one point to take from your point, Matt, is that 
Uh, there are these institutional entities that have oversight over delimited domains. They have a set of questions that they ask. The questions that they ask are themselves delimited, and the, and the sort of rules and limits are relatively well specified. But beyond that, they don't go. And therefore, if you're contending with issues that uh, are ambiguous or are difficult, you're sort of on your own. Um, you're not breaking any rules, but you may nevertheless be transgressing. So I want to invite each of you to reflect briefly on how uh, your own experiences and thoughts about how questions do come up, how they should come up, what constraints there are on asking those questions, whether in effect you're on your own, um, how, what the role of, of the research community is in asking those questions, and also, you know, coming to your point, um, Jacob, about the the way things are posed and politicization, the ways in which limits may be placed on those conversations as intra-scientific versus, um, versus as, as broader and more um, inclusive discussions, what is seen as at stake and potentially at risk in that. So, so you've each dealt with or are dealing with um, potentially controversial and transgressive domains of research. So how, to, how do you ask those questions? How should you ask those questions? We go down Should the line. Yeah, yeah, please. All right. Uh, yeah. So um, I think on on the brain organogenesis, I don't think is uh, too much difference from from other technologies like recombinant DNA or or genome editing in embryos and, and now synthetic embryos. Um, we start with a gray zone. Uh, we don't know where we are. We don't know if we are navigating this right. So we seek for help. Or we seek for ethicists, the philosophers of the mind. Um, we, we we try to gain input. Um, and, 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 and this is like uh, researchers who are interested on cutting edge, um, because after you define that, then, then there are rules and we, everybody just follow the rules. But if you're in the cutting edge, you really don't know how to do it. So uh, my personal approach is to seek help um, from, uh, from the community, from, from, from other scientists, from, um, from, from scientists that are not in my field, how they see it, um, and, and then trying to suggest a couple of um, uh, not a moratorium, but a couple of uh, rules that, that should be followed. Um, and we usually go by writing a scientific piece um, where we put out there so scientists can discuss and, and, and agree or disagree if that's, that's the way to go. Um, I noticed that some of my colleagues are a little bit refractory to that strategy because it, it, it might pose um, uh, an ethical dilemma or a question that might not even be there. Um, the example of a, a brain organoid reaching a conscious level. There is no evidence that we are in that stage, um, but uh, some of us are already discussing that possibility. I personally think it's inevitable to get there, um, but, um, but some people think it might be too, too early to discuss that, and we shouldn't because uh, the, um, the funding agents might get scared, uh, or the public might get scared, and that might create like an unnecessary roadblock um, for the research. Um, so it is the balance. I mean, how, how to navigate that? I don't have the right answer. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm used to do, and I, I think like open dialogue is the best approach. Um, but um, uh, and I and I I seen that in other other fields as well. Um, there is no right one answer at this stage. Yeah, uh, no no one answer. I, I would say um, I agree that. Uh, open discussion first within your institution or among your colleagues, followed by transparency and disclosure through publications and discussions at meetings uh, is important. I think that's actually, uh, can't see where Derek is, but then that's where the press comes in about um, maybe frustrating us sometimes by overhyping things. On the other hand, that does get the attention of a broader community that will start to weigh in. Again, you know, is consciousness in a dish would be a headline. All of a sudden, you've got some interest in people who aren't paying attention. And I think, uh, again, I think from those public discussions uh, can arise a relatively um, strong but not perfect um, set of soft barriers for people. And an example in the genome editing space was um, we know there were, you know, I can think of three researchers around the world who were proposing to do embryo editing, and after what occurred in China, all three of them have so far publicly backed off 
from their experiments because of the pressure they put on that that was no longer permissible or no longer acceptable science. However, if any of those three had decided that they wanted to ignore the consensus around them and ignore the, the, the noise around them, there was nothing uh, that could have been done to stop them. Uh, they could have continued with their research. So I believe that um, there is a, uh, you know, when we reach yeah, there's, there's the ability to reach consensus that people want to play within those, uh, again, those fences, but those fences can be soft if somebody uh, wants to, to charge through them. Um, they're, not, they're not rigid walls. Um, so, yeah, I'll stop there, because I don't know if I have anything else further to say. Yeah, um, yeah following up on that, I think, um, uh, I think obviously we try to as much as possible to um, talk to colleagues or uh, talk to some of ethicists, for example, in, in, in Israel. I went to meet, meet actually personally uh, with some rabbi that I heard about who's, who's a, actually a trained bioethicist. Um, and my point is actually also some, some of it is, is self-driven by myself and the things that I think about. Um, um, like for example, I can talk also uh, when you talk about uh, uh, some of the experiments we're doing with with the human IPS, so trying to make human models, um, it was very important for me to uh, something that was self-imposed is to ask to do this with IPS cells that were donated for that specific kind of research, not just for research. I want an individual really have, to, although there is no, I think, written regulation that specifically that for that specific experiment. And that's something that came out from, from that discussion and from uh, kind of self-thinking and uh, talking about. Um, but I want to say also there is um, some pressure uh, that, um, for example, what happens when you read um, some guidelines which you may not fully agree uh, with and whereas um, you, your duty, and, and, and again, this is not, we're not talking about laws, we're talking about recommendations. And for example, I give example, um, you know, for example, the International Society of Stem Cell Research has done really a great job on putting guidelines, uh, but for example, they very much uh, recommend against uh, using the word synthetic embryo, or they don't want to use the word embryoid. Um, and I can understand the arguments, in some cases so I agree, but also, you know, I would say that if we kind of a one-sided way, kind of trying to a uh, little bit brainwash and say, no, this is a synthetic embryo model is never going to be an embryo. It's not an embryo. We shouldn't do this comparison. I think there is something actually, in my personal opinion, something a little bit misleading about it. Uh, and, and I don't want to, and I'm very sensitive, I don't want to be caught in like saying that I, I'm, 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 um, that I'm being transparent. I think we should, I, sh I, 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 I think we should, call it for what it is, and, and discuss the current limitations. So that there is this dilemma, there's this pressure, then you're like, you know, it's a very powerful society, and, and how are you viewed? And I got some criticized, even some angry emails from certain scientists. Um, but, you know, that is, uh, um, uh, that is, that is the, the situation we have there. Um, and I think uh, that perhaps in the end, the most important thing, and which also Matthew brought, brought up, is, is really to, we're starting these discussions early and we are bringing even sometimes these extreme scenarios. Um, and we have to also remind ourselves that, uh, you know, if you look historically at certain things, I, you know, if you look back in the 80s when IVF started, there was a lot of concerns, uh, things like, well, are the embryos are gonna be normal or even scares like, is somebody gonna steal the sperm bank, which, you know, we know obviously didn't happen and you can prevent that. So we also have to have this kind of historic perspective on things and, and learn uh, and learn from that. Um, so that's my thoughts on this. Yeah, th so thanks so much. So I'm glad you brought up this terminology issue because I think it's actually a very interesting um, entry point for thinking about what openness means anyway. I mean, it's one thing to frame up a discussion, say, this is the question, this is what you need to know in order to participate in this discussion, and now we seek after an answer. Um, if the stakes of the framing, synthetic embryo versus some other term which seems much less provocative and much less likely to raise eyebrows, uh, is, is what is, are the sort of 
pre-conversation steps. Well, a pretty significant intervention is being made in closing down an open conversation, right? Um, and so one of the issues there, I think, comes back to what needs to be known and who needs to know it and who needs to say that there's a conversation that needs to be had and this is what the scope of the conversation should be and this is out of bounds. Allison, one of the things you said was that, you know, Dolly caught people by surprise, but in fact, there had actually been quite a lot of thinking and writing about cloning for decades before the advent of Dolly and there was a sense in which that was dismissed or sidelined or rejected as sort of frivolous um, by virtue of the fact that it wasn't technically possible. It was premature. And then suddenly it was too late. You sort of go from prematurity to, to being behind the eight ball instantly. Um, so I wonder if you'd each say something about openness. I mean, what does openness actually mean? What does openness mean within one's laboratory where there is a research agenda, there may be there, are, there is a community, there may not be consensus or univocality about what is appropriate or inappropriate to do. What are the ways in which there's, there are invitations or not for engagement around those questions? And, and furthermore, with respect to the sort of science society interface, to be simplistic about it, how should scientists think about their own agenda setting role in saying what should or shouldn't be discussed? Yeah, so that's... Uh, uh that is a difficult question. Um, I think just, I mean, on the, on the openness, uh, uh, and I, I, I see uh, different researchers having different styles. Um, there are some people that are really protective, um, and they want to do everything in secret. Uh, they just want to publish when is the last piece, when it's already done. And there are scientists who like to talk about their process. Oh, this is what I'm doing now. Uh, not necessarily I know what's the end point. Um, I try to be more on the, on the open side, try to, to talk about things that I'm, I'm currently thinking about doing or, or, or starting to doing, not necessarily only the, the final results. But that's, that's depending. There are competition in the academic side. Um, people are protective, as I mentioned. Um, and then there is the, uh, I think, the more uh, empathy side with uh, the public. And, and I think, to me, that is relevant because I deal with lots of uh, family foundations um, you know, for, for neurological conditions, and, and some of these foundations do support the lab. And I always invite them. You can come and see and check it out. Um, and it, it, it's harder to do that with more basic fundamental science when there is not like a treatment or a cure right away. Um, I have one, one instance. There is a, one work that we did on, on brain evolution where um, we swap uh, a, a gene, a, a modern human gene, for uh, an extinct version of a Neanderthal gene. And someone, someone wrote that, oh, this research is all done under closed doors in a lab in, in San Diego, <laughs> right? So it was not, never closed door. I mean, I don't know where, where the person took that out. Um, but, um, uh, but just to say that uh, I, I think the people also uh, see the scientists as too far away um, to come and, and reach out. Um, and, and I think there are a price that we are paying for the past generations who actually detach themselves from society by, by thinking that the science is something in isolation. Um, and, and we pay the price. I mean, scientific uh, outreach is, is highly compromised because of that. People don't understand vaccines. It's something that we should all learn in, in, in like, high school, um, and, and now we pay the price for that. I mean, there are people who won't take a vaccine. Um, so, I, and, and I think, I mean, this next generation needs to get closer and closer uh, to the public and make themselves available. Uh, most of my lab is funded by public money, so anybody should have the right to come and, and visit the lab and check it out how we do science um, and have a decent conversation with one of the scientists. And the scientists need to train their language to make the people understand what, what is going on. Um, so that's, that's what I think is an ideal world. If I look around to all my colleagues, do they all do that? Um, no, I mean, it's just like a minor fraction. But I think it's a matter of um, uh, uh, time for, these, for us to be able to revert that um, situation. I, I'm, I, I'm really positive about social media where, where scientists can expose their labs, can, can talk about science 
in an open way. So I think this is a plus that's coming uh, with all the negative sides uh, with social media, but there is a, a, a good side uh, for science outreach that we should take advantage of. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on, I think, the last part of your question, which is what role scientists play in the larger discussion. And I think they play a role. They play a really important role, but they um, are only one of many people who play that role. Um, and so two, two things to think about. One is, um, if you're an academic scientist, uh, you already have to work too much just to get promoted or to advance without doing any of that. So there's no academic reward to engaging in public discussions. And so uh, some people rightly say, don't do it. It's a, it's a waste of time for you because it's super hard to get promoted. And that's true. It is super hard to get promoted. Um, so there's, there's a lack of incentives and reward for doing that. Um, second thing I'll say about that is not everyone has a good talent for it. As much as you'd like to train people to speak in English uh, so that um, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I don't think our job is to make the public understand. It's not making someone understand. It is allowing them to understand enough to have a conversation with you. They still may disagree. So it's not like we're, it's not a one direction. Um, and I know you didn't mean it that way, but just sometimes we fall into that trap that it's scientists telling the public what they should think. And that is uh, fraught with problems. Um, it is scientists giving their perspective on an issue and then hearing from a lot of other people on their perspective. And then again, just to be provocative, I'm not on social media. And if you required me to be on social media to disseminate my science, uh, uh, that would be, uh, that would not, I would hate that. Um, so uh, that is not an enjoyable place for me to be. It's not an enjoyable place for me to expose myself. I think others feel comfortable in that space, but I don't. Um, so yes, a, a possible way to communicate with the public, but I don't think it's entirely the right solution either because not everyone is gonna feel comfortable in that space. Yeah, no, I uh, just to add on your exactly your point is that when we talk to the public and, and I give the example is, 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 uh, is, is give them the facts, yeah. and then they make their own opinion. And then, and then I think that's a very important point and just make sure that the facts Can I even are interrupt you there? Yeah. I think we give them our understanding at the current moment in time, because of 10 years from now, a fact now will be Classic. perceived as something we had a misunderstanding of what's going on, right? Your research is all about that. My research is all, you know, all of our research is about changing our understanding of a, a phenomenon that's occurring. So I hate to use the word fact because it implies it's immutable. Mm -hmm. I, I also understand that. Um, one other aspect um, that I want to raise in many times in research, um, you know, you, you hear sometimes again in social media or some of the word, you know, moratorium or this should be immediately banned or uh, very aggressive responses, um, which I also respect. Uh, but we, I think the danger many on that because a lot of the, some of the ethical con issues perhaps can be even addressed experimentally. And we need to slowly take our steps forward to consider that. And I give one example, something we are experimentally doing in the lab. Um, although we're, 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 not, we're not there yet, not to mention that it's only in mouse, but for example, if you, you, you talk to some people, okay, what, what, what scares you? And, 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 and they would tell, well, she's, she's, this is, should be considered a form of life. Uh, and that for then you could say, okay, what isn't concerned, uh, considered a form of life? And say, well, something that doesn't have a brain or something that doesn't have a heart. So we can experimentally these days, and something we do in the lab, we call them you know, developmentally restricted stem cells, where you can make a model that doesn't have the brain tissue, and there are genes like that. Or, uh, or actually, maybe the beating heart is not very important since we're relying on diffusion in this case. And my point is that actually, that it, this discussion is good to have because it actually also might dictate experimental solutions to circumvent ethical difficulties. And that's why it's, it's something it's good to have, not to have this immediate shot on things and actually and start early and have this exchange and, and think maybe actually even experimentally there can, can be solutions to some of these things. Though what you say raises this question about 
how experimental does one want to be? How, how incrementally does one want to, want to move into territories that are dangerous, even transgressive? I mean, do you want to grow the brain organoid until you have clear signatures of something that you might call consciousness and then say, oh, now, now we know, now we know where the line is. It was back there somewhere, you know, um, or because there is a sense in which, you know, limits you talked earlier about regulation. I mean, there's a sense in which one might understand limits as creating zones of freedom as opposed to as, as uh, creating constraints because it delimit, delimits um, you know, what is within and what is beyond um, the space of, of acceptable, what's acceptable and appropriate, which then of course raises questions about how one arrives at those, those limits and what sorts of inputs are necessary to arrive at those limits and whether you're in effect shutting down a conversation by saying, oh, well, this is our line and now we don't need to talk about whether that's where the line should be drawn. Um, I wonder if, if, uh, if anyone wants to engage with that, and in particular in relation to, well, what scares you, um, and and the ways in which, you know, that is inhibitory or not of your research, and and um, what what how you you would prefer that to be resolved, Allison? Do you want do you want a line? that says, all right, we're not sure, but this seems like a, a practicable limit um, that is a reflective of respect for you know, such and such concerns or principles? Or do you want to approach it experimentally and incrementally and get closer and closer until, one has, until you have a better sense of where you are? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And, uh, and, and, and just to clarify, we are not doing to find the limits. I think as we move, uh, we're going to find that limit. So, I mean, the example of the brain is an interesting one. As we add complexity, um, because we want to cure a specific disease, we might reach a level where the brain reaches the level of consciousness. Um, so it's not our intention to get there, but unintentionally, we're going to get there. Um, and then the question is, what, what do you do? I mean, maybe you need that level um, to cure or treat a specific disorder. Um, but then, I mean, you have these entities that have some level of consciousness. Um, uh, what, what should we do with them? Um, and, I mean, as a scientist, I, uh, of course, I mean, I'll abide to the scientific um, uh, uh, democracy that will decide where, where is the limit. Um, and I, I think we have, for example, in the embryo, we have this 14-day limit, um, which I think needs, needs a revision. Um, because a 14-day for a mouse is different for a 14-day for a human, um, what you can accomplish in terms of differentiation um, in a mouse is much faster, uh, and the human is just catching up. So if you really want to um, move this technology towards humans, I mean, we have to revisit that, um, that rule. Um, and I think that's, that's where uh, the scientist comes to the discussion, saying, well, we need to to maybe extend that, um, that thing or, or even revisit why we have that 14 rule in the first place. Um, so those, I, I don't think this set of rules are permanent or static. I think they should be very dynamic in, in receiving um, the input, not only from the scientists. I think the scientists can contribute to the research status now, um, but we should hear also um, from the public where, where they want to go. So the question would be, um, to treat a specific um, disease, I need to have a brain organoid that is fully conscious. Do we move forward with that or not? Um, maybe we should, we should ask the humanity, what, what should we do with that, right? I mean, and, and, and take it from there, what would be the limits of research? Um, I think I, I like the first rule of medicine, do no harm. As long as the technology is not harming anyone, um, then, then we are good. Um, but if now, if we started treating these organoid or, or these embryos as someone, then we are har uh, harming them. So I think the question becomes uh, back to us, or, or the philosophers, or the scientists, or, or the public, what are those entities? What, what is a, a human brain organoid? Um, it is the same status of a person. What is um, a synthetic embryo? Does it deserve the same status? of a natural embryo. So these are, to me, the big questions that we need to focus on. So I'm going to um, talk about the perhaps paradoxical um, 
consequences of imposing a limit, and I'll use an apocryphal story, which is, is that the story goes that in certain cultures, at certain ski areas, when the weather's terrible, everyone goes inside and is drinking their hot chocolate in the lodge. And as soon as the uh, ski area announces that they recommend that nobody go outside because the weather's so terrible, that's when everyone goes outside and starts skiing. Because now somebody has said, this is something you shouldn't do, so therefore everyone decides to do it. <laughs> so the unanticipated consequence of making a limit is you may actually attract certain personalities to try to break that limit. Um, and so just throwing it back, that there, there's, there's pros and cons of, of, of making these, because uh, you could highlight something that no one was thinking about, and now you attract people to say, well, I'm going to be the limit breaker. And we know certain examples where people thought that they were doing great things by being the person who, who broke a boundary that they thought was artificial, um, and that by breaking it, they would be, uh, might be perceived as a hero or, 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 or um, get accolades for doing so for being brave and breaking uh, a boundary that others were, were too um, cautious to try to break. So um, so I think I'm, I'm not, uh, and I also think that any limit we propose now would be informed uh, by increasing data to what that means. So I think uh, I'm reluctant to say that, there, that that would be an effective way of, hard limits would be, uh, I'm reluctant to say that hard limits would be an effective path forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I was hearing the, the, the talk also from Alison and you, and I think, again, I, to me, many times, the, it sounds perhaps cold in a way, but to me, many times it comes down to the cost versus benefit. Um, and the cost in this case is, is ethical, which is a very serious cost. But this is different from thinking, phrasing the question, uh, just simply ethical or non-ethical, and there we draw the line. And, uh, and and I can explain. For example, you know, as society, many times, even now, when you when you do drug testing, there is a cost. Sometimes there are drugs that fail, and some people die, and then that drug is stopped. But and that was, there was a cost. But there was we have to make sure that there was a general benefit because that is the process through which drugs get validated. Or even in another case scenario, there are many approved drugs that, or vaccines that, yes, in 0.001%, they might be lethal, but in 99%, 0.999, they're life-saving. And, and, and we have to also make that aware that sometimes uh, there is a cost. And, and going back to the limits, you know, and, and, and of course we should do everything we can to avoid something that is unwanted. But you might think also when it comes to some experiments, if by mistake, and I mentioned my mistake emphasis, um, you know, let's say an experiment works and, and, and something happened that is unwanted, and then we want to pedal back. So yes, there was a mistake and that was an unwanted, should be avoided, but we still should not overlook the benefit uh, of there. So these things are very, uh, fluid, and uh, as long as they're doing from like good intention and reasonably careful regulation and, and checking, and not you know not uh, uh, kind of reckless, but um, as, as uh, that we, we many modern medicine and you know many example ER triaging of patients, there is a cost, and we shouldn't overlook that. Yeah, I mean, of course, the question of how those costs and benefits are defined. I mean. The, and who bears the cost? And who bears the, cost. the, the disobedient skiers are out there for the really good snow and a little bit of risk. And right, um, I want to open it up to the audience now um, and invite questions from all of you. Do we have some mics to pass around? Does anybody want to join in? Sheila, here in the front. Yeah, this is uh, Sheila Jasnoff again. Uh, thank you for this incredibly interesting set of, of reflections. Uh, I guess the very simple question I have goes back to this uh, idea, Alison, that you mentioned that I hear from scientists all the time. The, it's this concern about the fearful public, that the public will get scared if you use the wrong language, if you move too far ahead of where the actual feasibility of the science lies and project scenarios that might be uh, blown out of proportion. Uh, Matt, you referred to the media and you know how 
Of course, you were very thoughtful and said that sometimes the media overblowing something may actually be an experimentally good thing to do because it, it makes people think ahead. But I'm wondering where you draw the line between something that one might call a legitimate ethical concern and fear. I mean, so all of you have are either clinically trained or have experience with clinical medicine. And I think in clinical medicine, people are continually telling people things that are at the uttermost extremes of their fear. Their fear about their own lives, you know, or their children's lives. You're presenting treatments and you're presenting costs and benefits, Jacob. I mean, about, you know, what is the likelihood that, that your child is going to survive this treatment, which may be experimental to some degree. So as clinicians or paramedic clinicians or whatever, you know that, that you're dealing with public fear in its most extreme uh, manifestations. And yet, when it comes to thinking about limits on research, there's somehow a sense that this fear in the public is something that needs to be controlled. So there seems to be a contradiction between, on the one hand, the everyday experience of dealing with people's fears about their loved ones, their lives, their well-being, their health, and yet this projection of the inchoate public with a set of uncontrollable fears. So I would like to explore that, and maybe a very pointed question is, are there any occasions you can think of in your own practice where a conversation with somebody other than a scientist, and especially other than a scientist specifically doing your thing, has caused you to wonder or reshape or reconstitute a way that you thought of as an experiment or you know, given you a different sense of limits? I, I can start with uh, uh, something that is happening right now. Um, last issue of science, we have a discussion about researchers on, on autism and the public percep perception of autism. Autism is a moving target. The definition of autism changes over time and now is much broader than um, when I was starting with autism. Um, the initial definition was like kids that are severely affected, nonverbal, um, full of uh, uh, comorbidities like seizures, epilepsy, um, very dramatic cases. So the scientists start to work on autism to help those cases. So now we're calling uh, about a spectrum. So there are um, people, kids, um, adult individuals under the spectrum that doesn't have all these uh, severe uh, traits. Um, they are more on the mild side. Maybe they are fully independent, they're married, they have um, a job, and they live a fully independent life. So now when they look at what the researchers are doing, they might think, oh, I don't want to be cured. I don't need the treatment. I'm fine. I just need acceptance. So this is a case that um, is escalating quite quickly um, to the point where uh, researchers are moving away from this field. I don't want to work on autism anymore because I mean these people are attacking me either on social media or, or, or in other platforms and even pushing the government to stop funding on autism because we don't need a cure, we don't need a treatment. So that's to me a, an instance that I'm, I'm scared about that um, because the most um, uh, uh, the kids on, on, on the most severe end of the spectrum, these are the most uh, challenged population, they, they are, I mean, uh, the risk is that uh, there is not going to be like a treatment or, 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 or research on them because of these uh, more verbal, uh, vocal population that, that disturb a little bit how the science is doing. So that's, that's one example that is, is, is happening right now. So I think I'm, I'm fear about the public perception on, on autism because of that. They might drive away um, all the funds for research. Yeah, I, I, I can. Th you, I think I'm hearing the question of any personal examples of where um, somebody's fear or alternative way of looking at it has changed the way I think about things, and I, uh, I I'm going to give two examples, um, both related to sickle cell disease. So um, there's a lot of families and patients 
who uh, are reluctant or won't go through a bone marrow transplant for sickle cell disease because part of the transplant is to receive chemotherapy that most likely, if not not 100%, but close to 100% will result in infertility. And the patients and the families will decide that that's not a risk uh, that they uh, wish taking. And I would say earlier in my career, I thought that, that's an irrational decision. This disease is terrible. What do you care about uh, whether you're going to have kids or not when you're going to die um, even before you can have kids? And it's shaped, reshaped my vision and my emphasis on my research is that, well, Maybe we should figure out a way of being able to do bone marrow transplants without chemotherapy and causing infertility. So that, with time, has sunk in that while I didn't quite get it, I now get that that's real, and it shapes some of what we're doing um, in, in our research. The second example is uh, really, um, I'm not sure this is going to answer your question, but the, the or, but uh, is when is there enough evidence in your preclinical or non-clinical models, which by definition are not identical to a human being, um, that it is worth now moving into the first patients uh, or the first patient or patients. And um, living that right now, I can tell you it's not the patient's fears uh, that are driving me. It's my own uncertainty and feeling like I can't get there's no way of obtaining perfect knowledge to know now's the time to move or no, we need to continue to work on this for a certain amount of time before we hit this benchmark, before it's worth moving into patients. And you know, increasingly realize that um, it, is a real, it is a real thing when we thank patients for their bravery when they enter a phase one, two trial um, because they truly are, uh, we cannot give them perfect guarantees uh, about whether this will be safe or effective. And so they truly are, with their own lives, stepping into a protocol um, that they're putting themselves at risk that we, you know, we, we don't have to do. So um, I would say those two uh, are examples of how absolutely the engagement with patients and their families are shaping how I'm thinking about what we need to do in the lab. Yeah, um, yeah I would say, uh Talking about fear, I'll give a negative and positive aspect. And I think um, <clears throat> following up on, on what Matthew said, and if you think about it, um, so the, the first IVF babies, uh, you know, were fortunate that the technology works and they were born and they were normal embryos. But you could have easily envisioned the scenarios that those first babies were, could have been abnormal and the technology would have been very bad. And... Um, and so, so it's going back that you, you, I think everybody who does this has this fear. And even if you think you can predict and you do your maximum to reduce and evaluate, you might also run into unanticipated um, caveats or difficulties or abnormalities. And I think we also, that's part of to be personal as, as scientists, you know, it's something I think our clinicians, it, it's scary, it's a responsibility, but also. We have to understand there's a limit to how much we can uh, evaluate and, and, and live with that before an actual treatment or an experiment is, is done. That is uh, one example. Um, the second, second uh, perhaps strange uh, example, um, well, I, um, um, actually when we published our first uh, paper, I got a phone call from the head of the Greek Orthodox Church in, in, in Israel. And I got very, very scared in the first phone call, and he congratulated me. I, this is the background. I'm in Israel, but I'm Christian. I'm not religious, but I have respect for religion. And he just congratulated me because I'm you know, part of the, <laughs> the community. And then the second paper, when they had the second uh, um, uh, the synthetic embryo models, I get a second phone call, and I got scared that it was um, then again congratulating me. And then actually then I asked him, you know, not like father. Um, I want to ask you that. Do you really like know exactly what we did and what are your thoughts? And we had a conversation, and there I had a very uh, surprising answer for him. For him, for example, he said, "Well, in my opinion, um, God um, uh, is allowing you to grow stem cells uh, from an embryo, and and in his perspective, then since He's given you that availability, and you should you know you sh you should try to make benefit." from it. 
Now, I'm not saying this is the <laughs> representing or solving my uh, any difficulties from any other religion, even from the same dominion. Uh, but that kind of also just give me an example that it was really benef you can get very interesting opinions and uh, about it, and, and it's encouraged me to to just talk more and be as much as possible open about it. We have a question here. Hello. Um, so I have been on a board for, uh, it's called the Merck Ethics Advisory Panel for the last uh, 10 years. Um, the panel consists of um, two philosophers, a lawyer, and a professional ethicist, and me. I'm a scientist. And what we've been doing over these years is coming up with a, with a group of um, we call principles, which we publish on their website. Um, and they're very, they're very proud of this. But it's always a hybrid. I've had input on every single one of those because as a scientist, I can explain to the people what it is that I think is feasible or how hard it is to do and what is needed in order to do it. And so I was thinking, um, well, by the way, Merck owns Sigma, so they are worried about CRISPR. Uh, they own Millipore, um, and they own a, a company that makes reagents for IVF. So besides being a pharma company, they have a lot of things to worry about. And, and they're also private, so the family owns the company, and they do not want to show up in the newspapers. So they are very sensitive to criticism, with that as background. So, um, Allison, you were talking about uh, the possibility that people might think that your organoids are actually have... Uh, you know, human qualities that they can think. And I think this is one of those situations in which we need to tell people what a human brain actually consists of and all the connections that need to be made in such a perfect way. And that happens during embryogenesis. This is all done by self-assembly with the help of all these interactions between cells. And so it's not possible for one of our organoids to think because we can't make an organoid as complex as the brain, and you need something as complex as the brain. So I think, I think scientists have, I mean, I've certainly enjoyed this over the last decade. Um, scientists really do need to be exposed to what the ethical issues are and be able to actually contribute to the you know, thinking about, and the publicity, in this case, about the ethical issues. So um, I'm, I'm just suggesting that as a, as a a venue that maybe could be expanded beyond what I've I've been doing. Any comments? Yeah. Oh. I think we have another question. If not, please. Let's go to Tim. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Adrian Shapiro, and um, I'm fifth generation of mothers in my family to have a child born with sickle cell disease, and um, as I'm sitting here, my chest is kind of like, uh, how, how do I say this? Um, there's a number of things. You asked first about the fear. So the fear for me is that um, the work will stop. More than anything, the fear for me is that the work will stop. So I say that because we had 125 years of nothing, of knowing about sickle cell and not knowing, you know. And suddenly in 10 years, I've gone from praying that I would be the last generation in my family to have a child with sickle uh, to knowing that, that that's really here, that's really possible. Um, and I, I think, I'm, and I met a lot of other mothers Right? I thought I, I thought my disease burden was heavy. Now my disease bur burden is heavier in a, a societal way because it affects black and brown people. And we have to deal with all of that, right? As well as our illness. But mothers who had buried three children, husbands, wives, grandchildren, right? Carried that burden. So. There are a couple of things I always want to say to you scientists. One is, we understand how hard your work is. And we understand that every time things don't come out right, you feel you failed. We see that as you have learned something not to do next time. And also that you're going to share it with somebody, and it might be something that they didn't do that they should be doing. 
We also understand that for you to lose a life, that it's really difficult. And on our side, yes, we lose a life, but we lost a life that was brave and hopefully helping to make change. So we, we understand that. I think the lesson I've learned in the last 10 years is that although we are moving into this transformative space of medicine, which all of us, you know, we're handing over our bodies, you guys are taking our bodies and that and, and doing it. We haven't done anything to really look at it from the, uh, we're looking at it from the physical space, not from the mental space. And I really think that we would benefit at having somebody really look at what does that mean now that medicine has moved into technology and away from that black box and you take a pill. Um, I think that that's something that was very important. The other thing is I think that all of us benefit from having a, a genesis, a start, where everybody that's affected is in the room talking about it. So for example, when I first started, thanks to CIRM, uh, being part of a clinical trial, and the scientists have been working really hard, and, and I'd been following their science for 20 years, so I knew them intimately. But when they pulled up the person that they had selected as their first trial subject, I was like, I don't, I, I would like to know why you selected this person. Because from a cultural, physiologic way of knowing, knowing the disease, right, knowing and understanding, I could talk to them about what a better choice was, not just that the person had the genetic illness they were looking at, but there were other factors. So I think that, um, like CERM requires for you to have people. I think mean, let's follow the money. So you said, how do I have limits? What do I need to have in place? I think that if you have the source that's giving you funding, right, has really, really looked at this and is offering you, not offering, requiring you to have all those voices together, that that will save you a lot of, um, of time and, and, and help you to gain where you're going on this ethical journey, right? So I sit here and you're talking about maybe people being concerned about humanoids having feelings. And I have people in my community begging for pain medicine, right? And of a diagnosed disease in complete and total distress. And there are people so concerned about them being drug addicts that they won't give them the pain meds. And so you can't manage people. What you have to do is understand humans. And they're going to be on that bell curve. And you've got to be ready. And how do you get ready? You've hit on some of it. A lot of people talk about social media. You have to be strategic about that as you are about your research. And it's not your skill set, sorry. I mean, many of you are. I know a couple that can do any and everything. Uh, but you need to look at your teams. And when you are really talking about what you need to succeed, you need someone uh, that understands the sociology, the psychology, and someone who can interpret what you're doing. And not only just interpret it in the sense that um, you can explain the mechanism, but also what that means on both sides. What that means from you, the scientist community you're doing, and what is it going to be to the, to the community receiving it? So I've talked too long again, Thanks. but. Thanks. <laughs> First of all, th thank you for your comments, and, and thank you for your engagement uh, with us uh, around these new therapies. Uh, it's in incredibly useful and important, and, and I know it, you know, it takes time. And, uh, and I think it's one of the real strengths of CIRM um, that they have mandated that every program like this has a, an advocate, a representative of the community who's an, a, an advisor. And I know our program, um, we had um, um, somebody like that, and she, she was incredibly valuable. So um, the other thing I, I think that's really valuable about that is um, not only is it a conduit 
for information from the community to us as scientists and physician scientists, um, it's a bi-directional conduit, right? You help us understand how to communicate to the community that you're representing, but we also get educated by you about what the community is thinking. It's, it's an incredible, so thank you for your time, but thank you also for CIRM for recognizing that that's an important part uh, of, of this translational process. That being said, as you probably are well aware, once a program moves into a private company, that gets lost. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I gotta think about how we, we, we keep that strength because it does, it gets lost. And the voices uh, advocating uh, for this also get lost. Um, and you get start hearing uh, voices who may not have the community's best interests at heart um, get heard more. And um, I'll just be quiet because uh, it'll get me on a soapbox and I'm <laughs> very frustrated with that right now. Um, so, um, um, so yeah, I think that's great. Oh, and, you're in, and you made a comment about 125 years, you know, and we could ar argue it's even longer than that, that this disease has been ignored. Um, and then the la it's only in the last decade that we're starting to see real um, dedicated effort to developing better therapies for patients with sickle cell disease, and your fear that that uh, spigot might get turned off, I fear it too. Um, I think uh, that great start to that, um, but I worry that a few unexpected events will turn the spigot off, and the people who have the cash to support the development of these therapies will decide the Mercs of the world, not blaming Merck, but they may decide that this is not worth the publicity for us to put our resources into and we'll, we'll, we'll move our resources into another disease that maybe is uh, you know, less risky in terms of potential adverse publicity. So hopefully in the next few years we can make that a solid foundation, but I think it's not, we're not there yet. So um, perspective from working with Jamie Thompson back in the, the late 90s. And one of the things you know people may not realize is before he did human embryonic stem cells, uh, getting back to something Jacob mentioned is he worked on non-human primates, right? And he worked out these conditions in non-human primates um, uh, before he did the human work. And you know one question is, you know for some of your work, and, and Jacob you know sort of mentioned this, is that you know, sort of a, a resource we should be using more as one to, to learn from, one to, you know, sort of set the stage, um, you know, to make people, I don't know if the right word is more comfortable, but, you know, something Allison said about Dolly is, is we weren't ready for it, right? But, you know, it is a great resource that's out there and, and to make sure that we can do that. Or have we sort of blown through that or, and we should just do this with, with all human cells. And, and so that's sort of a question for you. The, the other thing, and, and maybe some advice on, on how to handle, because obviously, you know, my bias and, you know, I appreciate, again, what Jacob said about, you know, the, the minister, you know, supporting the, the, the work that we're able to do. I still review papers on iPS cells, and they say iPS cells are an advantage because they don't have the ethical baggage of human ES cells. And I make them edit that out of any scientific paper that I review, right? And we should be using these resources. This is not an, you know, I'm not reviewing an ethical piece, right? I mean, if they want to debate, you know, that that's in another place. But, but that perspective is still out there, right? And, and you know, uh, you know, for, for people who I think mean well, but, but it's, it's just how do we sort of get past these things, right? I don't know if yeah. any perspective on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I can, you know, really uh, relate to this. I can tell you, you know, I have many con um, conversations with, with colleagues in Germany, for example, and uh, the way I think well, I think it's not a good situation, but it's very convenient for them, which, for example, um, uh, talking about brain organoids and the work, and just the way that things got set, well, if it's, uh, if it's, it's, if it's IP, IPS cells, then it's completely fine, versus like, if it's from ES cells, it's a complete no-no, and I think, um, 
these kind of situation, I think we would like to avoid, although they can be very convenient, because this way, let's say, okay, let's keep the public quiet, but I don't think that is the reality. I think we, we, we want to reach situations that are um, very realistic and, 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 and trust that the, the, the public is wise and the public is smart to, to make uh, uh, um, uh, its uh, opinion. And for another example, for example, in Austria, so the, just the way the law is set, they cannot use embryos, excess embryos that were made in Austria, but they can fly them from France and do the same experiments. So I'm just giving examples that I think these scenarios should be avoided in general and more just be more uh, opinion and not to go through these loopholes and because uh, um, this is IPS and not ES as, as you mentioned. So I want to invite a last, last comments from Allison and Matt if you have any to make. Um, just less comments overall. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you want to say, as long as it's 30 no, I, seconds I, or less. I, I think that, that, that's fabulous that we are having this discussion. Thank you, you guys, for organizing. Thank you, Jacob, to capitalize or, or we leverage on your talk here um, to uh, stimulate the discussion. Um, and, and I think that's what we should do. We should continue this dialogue. We should um, hear from, from many people in different areas. Um, in, 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 in science, we always, always move along. Um, and I think, as I, I mentioned before, most of the scientists that I know have a, a good goal in mind, which is um, to make the good for humanity. So as long as that goal continues, I think we are, we are safe. My closing comment is, is when the Global Observatory, when you described the founding of it, I thought that why do we need this? We have all these international commissions and studies, study committees that are meeting and, and describing the issue. And now what I realize is those come and go. And what we need is an organization that keeps an eye on all of us and integrates all of us uh, across the world um, that doesn't come and go based on the formation and dissolution of a committee that puts out a report. So. Um, I guess I'm, I now get it. <laughs> Jacob, any last words? No, okay, all right, great. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Appreciate that last comment. We are here watching you. <laughs> no, we are, we are the, the purpose is to You're observing, yet yeah, merely observing. Um, uh, of course, our central aim is to convene conversations of this sort that touch upon difficult things that are not easily resolved, but in contending with them and continuing to contend with them, um, we make progress. So thank you very much. Let's thank this panel.